Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Life Centre here in, in Sale in Greater Manchester for the 2019 Brass Band Conference. I'm Kenny Crookston. I am the Chief Executive of Brass Bands England and I'm absolutely delighted that you can all join us here today. Um, we're looking forward to a terrific day, topical banding debate, some very informative breakout sessions and hopefully a good idea or two that we can take back to our own bands, our own organisations as we all strive for better banding in the years ahead. Before we go any further, we don't expect any fire alarms, um, but if you hear one, please make your way immediately to the nearest signposted fire escape. There's one over there, there's one over there, and if you are really in trouble, you can head down the main stairs and out the front door. If you can assemble in the car park behind the building, if that happens, we don't expect it to happen. And if anybody thinks that they may need any assistance if, in the event of such a thing happening, um, if you could let a member of the hall staff know um, fairly quickly, uh, that would be something that they would implement at the time. But uh, just these are just precautionary things, of course, we don't expect anything like that. If you need to go to the toilet, they're out there on the right. Um, you don't need to ask if you're in a hurry. Um, and lunch will be served at 12.15. So that's all the uh, procedural stuff out of the way. Uh, so why do we need a brass band conference at all? We've managed to get through nearly 200 years of brass banding without many of them. So what is it about this one that's going to make it a worthwhile prospect? We have a proliferation of brass band bodies across our world, encouraging productive dialogue. But brass bands in England have never been particularly adept at this, discussing things collectively. We've just we've never done it very well. A hundred years ago, you may have written a letter to the bandsman, and that would have been the, practically the only and certainly the most effective way of making your point and starting a debate. And that's pretty much how things were until four bars less came along in about 2001. And with the instant communications, things started to become a bit more lively. But collectively, we've still never been brilliant at getting in the same room. We have had a couple of occasions within the last 10 years when people have tried to inspire um, a new way, new organisations, but um, one way or another, they have not really managed to get too far out the starting blocks. Quite simply, like the rest of the artistic community, we want to stimulate d debate among brass banders and find out what you, brass bands, brass banding's biggest stakeholders, want from your banding activities in the years ahead. There's no grand promises that will reach the promised land sometime next week. But every journey requires its first steps, and we are delighted to be able to provide the first ones, and we hope we can make some difference in the years ahead. As the day proceeds, there will be opportunities to ask questions or make comments. The post-it notes on your tables should be there. If they're not there, they're probably in the, the coffee room outside, but we'll make sure they're there soon. Um, as many comments as you wish, positive or otherwise, please keep them respectful. Um, there's also a, a questionnaire for you to complete, and we we'll encourage as many as possible to do this before the end of the day. We'll also be taking questions on social media. So for those watching worldwide on Facebook Live, please follow us on Twitter and use the hashtag BetterBanding. Parke, my colleague, who's going to be around the place um, and very visible for the day, will be monitoring the, the feed as the afternoon debate takes place, and we will try to air as many questions and comments as possible. We really do want to know what people in the world of the brass bands think. And finally, before we get properly started, feel free to take as many pictures as you want and share them on social media. There are plenty of lovely BBE banners that make a fantastic backdrop. So we're looking forward to being all over Twitter and Facebook by the end of tonight. So that's enough for me. I'm sure you've already agreed that. Um, it gives me the greatest pleasure, genuinely, to welcome to the first brass band conference, one of the finest composers ever to grace the, the, grace the brass band stage. With major works spanning five decades and a portfolio that includes great music for bands at all levels, as well as pillars of her repertoire like connotations, dances and arias of men and mountains, or rococo variations of distant memories. When we first spoke about his appearance today, I did invite him to talk about any subject relating to brass bands that he wished. So the next half hour or so is going to be as much of a surprise for me 
as it is hopefully engaging for you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Edward Gregson. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see so many people here on a Saturday morning when you could be doing so many other things, supermarket shopping, um, watching Ireland and Japan in the Rugby World Cup, or turning on to the 12.30 kickoff on Sky of the Premier League. But no, you're here, which is great, which means that you're enthusiastic and that you want to be here today because perhaps you think that the future is going to be bright for brass bands, as indeed I do. But to uh, achieve that future, maybe some radical things need to happen. So when Kenny um, asked me, phoned me, and, and asked me to be the keynote speaker today, uh, the reason he gave for asking me was that I was someone who had the good fortune of being able to look at the brass band world or the community from outside in, but also as a composer, as he just kindly said, who's written a large slice of repertoire over the last 50 years that's helped to take the brass band movement forward. So I appreciated his kind words just now. Um, and so, in a way, it is that view that I have about the banding world. Um, why outside in? Well, from early on, and if I'm repeating myself in interviews I've done before, but not all of you will have seen those or heard them or whatever, so I'm just going to repeat some of those. And some of you may know about my, my past, but not, not all of you probably do. So from early on, uh, I led a double life in, in the musical sense. I was brought up, my parents were ministers in the Salvation Army, and therefore I played in a brass band. I started on tenor horn, went to baritone and euphonium. I didn't go down to tuba. It was too much of a break, you know. So I, I stopped there and, and, and I was in euphonium. In fact, until I went to the Royal Academy in London to study, uh, which is when I, I started to take life a little bit more seriously and realized I had to work very hard to become a proper composer. Um, so on the one hand, I was, I was playing in a brass band and I was listening to the music, and you will know some of this music repertoire of Wilfred Heaton and Ray Steadman Allen and Dean Goffin and Leslie Condon. Terrific music, albeit based in, in a religious framework um, on, on, on sort of gospel songs and hymns, etc., but very cleverly uh, composed in a classical sense. So I, on the one hand, I was playing that music, and on the other, I, I was studying piano, and I started to write music when I was about 11 years old. You wouldn't want to hear it now. Dreadful stuff. Well, I was only 11. Um, but uh, I had also started to compose brass band pieces at that stage. So those of you who know my symphonic rhapsody for euphonium and band, I first started that when I was about 17. I uh, didn't know how to finish it, interestingly enough, at that stage. So I had to finish it a few years later. Prelude and Caprizio for Cornet and Band, that started life when I was about 16. And the Concertante for Piano and, and Brass Band, which I wrote when I was at the Academy as a third year student, which was the first work really, I would say, that I'd completed and I was happy with as a, as a kind of overall piece with Brass Band, as it were. I'd also written a march much earlier on um, when I was in Sweden um, called Dallaro. Some of you may know that. Um, I fell in love with a Swedish girl at that time, but it didn't last long. But uh, she got the dedication of the march, so, I mean, what more can you ask for? Um, but at the same time, when I was at the Academy, my actual opus one, as it were, was an oboe sonata. So hence, again, this kind of double life of partly being in and the psyche of brass bands and, and outside. What about the other credentials in terms of mean understanding and knowing about the brass band world? Well, uh, again, I conducted, when I was in the 70s, I conducted a group called London Collegiate Brass, which was made up of some of the best young student players at um, the uh, London colleges. And we played mainly a contemporary repertoire um, at that stage. And indeed, I, I, I produced two programs for Radio 3 on the contemporary repertoire. Um, and that doesn't happen, sadly, anymore, but I'll come on to that. Um, I also edited The British Bandsman when Geoffrey Brand was away on holiday. Uh, so that was quite interesting, getting to know what you had to do to be an editor. That was fun. 
I also later on co-edited a new quarterly magazine for brass players called Sounding Brass. Some of you may remember that, which was an attempt to bring the two worlds of brass playing together, the amateur and the professional. Uh, I was a member of the Artistic Music Committee of the National Championships uh, for Bo when Boozy and Hawks uh, ran, ran it. Uh, and one of the great things I think we did then was to bring Wilfred Heaton's contest music, which had been rejected at an earlier stage. We brought that back as the test piece uh, at the Albert Hall. Uh, I was the founder music director of the National Youth Brass Band of Wales, uh, something I'm very proud of. I'm very proud of that band. I'm still the president of it. Um, and I was recently composer in residence uh, with Black Dyke, as I see Peter Graham is over there. And of course, he has been as well. So whilst on the one hand, um, through that time, I was also pursuing a career academically as a university lecturer, um, uh, composing as one word for orchestra, chamber music, instrumental music, working. I worked for the BBC Young Musician of the Year as a, as, as a commentator. Um, and later, and I'll come on to this, when, when I mentioned copyright, um, I became a, a PRS board member, Performing Rights Society. I'm still a writer-director of that organization. And there is later uh, a breakout session on copyright, which is, particularly in, these, in the digital age, of huge importance. Um, and it's an area which, frankly, is just not policed properly, and where actually the owners of copyright, albeit they, they may be composers, uh, they may be publishers, uh, really, it's very, very difficult in this di new digital age of Spotify, Amazon, iTunes to get proper uh, recompense for, for one's copyright works when they're performed or, or taken over the, uh, over the digital platforms. Um, so that's my kind of background. Um, so to reinforce, I'm looking at the band world from the outside in, but also knowing quite a bit of how it works from the inside. But then I don't... I'm not on a day-to-day -day basis in the band world. So I hope that my, my comments today, my, 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 th my, my themes, as it were, will stimulate discussion. Um, Kenny said that I could be controversial if I wanted to be, so I'm going to be controversial. You may not agree with everything I say, but at least they're thoughts that are genuine and they're meant to be constructive and they're meant to stimulate debate, which I hope it'll do later in the day. And I hope more than anything, actually, that things will change in several areas for brass banding if we're going to have a sustainable future. Because I really do believe that um, some of the inertia, perhaps if you call it that, that we pre presently experience is really a fault, if you can put it that way, of our tradition. Traditions are great things, but traditions often uh, are weight-bearing. They, they weigh you to the ground because you think, well, we started the brass band. Um, we must, you know, continue the, et cetera. It's interesting, as the European model, the European banding has progressed, in one sense, some of the aspects of European banding have overtaken what's happening in this country. So I, I think, actually, we can learn a lot from Europe, just as, indeed, they learnt a lot from us when they set up the infrastructure of their banding as well. So, how, first of all, how do I see the current state of affairs? Um, how relevant are brass bands in, in, in the wider musical world? I should say, first of all, I'm speaking from, in this sense, as a classical, as a classical music composer and as someone who has immersed in the classical music world. Many of you will know I was the principal of the Royal Northern College of Music for 12 years. So I've been very much involved in that world. And I want to see brass bands returning more to being respected by that world than they are at the moment. So I'm speaking from that point of view. If you want someone that's talking about brass bands as entertainment, et cetera, you've got the wrong person. I mean, brass bands are entertaining, and it's, it's interesting to see the Brass in Concert uh, series where bands have to take a different view of how to entertain an audience. Nothing wrong with entertainment, absolutely not. But is that all that brass bands want? Or do they want more than that? Do they want a different kind of musical satisfaction as well as all the other things? Those are questions that we need to ask ourselves as well. But if, if the answer is how relevant are bands in the wider musical world, in the classical world as we understand it, well, I'm afraid that the answer is not very. I don't think brass bands are taken seriously by the musical establishment. 
For example, the BBC, music critics who write for the national papers or magazines, orchestras and all the infrastructure there. They're not asked to participate, very rarely anyway, in major arts festivals anymore. The CDs that brass bands produce, which are after all produced to a very high level of, of playing performance, are not reviewed in monthly magazines such as Gramophone, BBC Magazine. You never see them, hardly ever. And when Radio 3, for example, I don't know how many of you listen ever to Radio 3, but if you listen to Radio 3 and the breakfast show, as they call it, um, it's very rare that you hear a brass band track. If you do, it's nearly always whole small side suite, the first movement or the last movement, or it's bourgeois serenade, or it's padstone lifeboat. And that's about the... And, yeah, I, I ask myself, well, is that really all that BBC producers can come up with? because it's pretty pathetic. But anyway, that's the way that I think the BBC regard brass bands. The one glimpse of light in that is the annual Festival of Brass at the RNCM, which at least now gets a performance on three slot in the evening. And so audiences can hear what I would call serious music that brass bands play and maybe surprise some people I didn't know they played that kind of music. So there, there, are, there are kind of glimmers of light, as it were, within this, this kind of spectrum. Does this mean that we, the brass band world, has become insular and a self-regarding movement? If so, is it the fault of the bands or of the wider musical world? Well, of course, I think it's a bit of both. There was a time, of course, as those of you who are old enough to remember, and it's good to see so many people here, by the way, who are under 50 or even under 40. That's great. Uh, because you don't always see that in brass band concerts, for example. I shall come on to that later. But it's good to see uh, such, a, such a, a widely diversified audience here today. And those of you who do remember who are my kind of generation or just under might remember in the 60s and 70s when things looked very different when there were what I would call the movers and shakers, such as Elgar Howarth, Ifa James, Geoffrey Brand, to name but three, who were looking to the wider musical world because they had experience in it as professional people, uh, commissioning composers such as Thea Musgrave, Thomas Wilson, Hans Werner Henze, George Benjamin, Harrison Bertwistle, Paul Patterson, Anthony Payne, I could go on the list for another 20 or 30 composers who are composers who had never written for bands before, but wrote during that 20 year period. Sadly, that repertoire is hardly ever played anymore. And then later on, figures such as Howard Snell, who started to introduce brass band studies into the UK conservatoires. And of course, I'm very proud that the RNCM was the flag bearer, uh, the flag waver, if you like, in that regard. But now, if you look at the other conservatoires, in Cardiff and in Birmingham, they have fantastic brass bands and they have, as part of their degree structure, the fact that you can do your final recital on a brass band instrument and you can do part of your curriculum towards your degree, written, written, the written side of it, on brass band studies, whether it be arranging, transcription, history of brass band music, so on and so forth. So there are glimmers of light there, certainly. And we have to thank those people for kind of, at that stage, trying to change the world. Um, and it, it did look quite rosy. So what's happened to that? What's happened to all those initiatives that we find ourselves now in a different kind of world? Well, the C word, which is contesting. You got it in one. Here I go. So forgive me for this. Some of you may disagree, but I'm just going to be very honest about it. We all know, for example, in contesting, there are pros and cons. Let's have no doubt about that. So let's start with the positives about contesting. There's no doubt that the standards we now experience, particularly amongst the top level bands, but to be fair, lower section bands as well, have been achieved through a century or more of brass band competitions. The music, the test pieces have become increasingly difficult, both technically and musically, and have encouraged ever more time consuming and detailed rehearsal. And the best, performance on the best performances on stage are quite honestly mind-blowingly good, no doubt about that. 
Competitions have always had a positive, also had a positive effect, as I said, on lower section bands for the same reasons. Indeed, these days, they're asked to play works that previously appeared as championship section test pieces. Some of those decisions aren't always wise because, frankly, it's just beyond some of the bands. But at least there is that aspiration that they can get to repertoire which previously would have been heard in the champion section at the Albert Hall or wherever. And I'd admit that as a composer, when I've heard a wonderfully uplifting performance of one of my pieces at a contest, it almost equals the thrill of a fine performance by a symphony orchestra. So that's the good news. That's the good now for the bad and the ugly, as the saying goes. Well, for me, contesting seems to have become an obsession. Perhaps it always was, but it's reached new heights of distraction. There's more space now in brass band magazines and websites taken up with the minutiae of contesting than there ever was. Live opinions on each performance as they happen, predictions of who might win, Lists of world rankings published weekly, which seem to dominate bands, and players, and conductors' psyches. Do I blame the brass band media for this saturation? No, I don't. They're merely reflecting the rather obsessional nature of the banding world for contesting and all its associated minutiae. I mean, I think this was very well illustrated. Part of, part of my preparation for this um, uh, speech today was actually to look at the sky uh, TV programs, the four. How many of you saw those? Oh, that's good. Half, about half of you. That was good. Well, I'd recommend if you can, I know Sky subscriptions, are, but go around to a friend who's got Sky and uh, just go to Catch Up TV and watch them as I did. And I, I, thought, I thought they were fascinating. They, they were, they were, for a start, they were really well produced. It must have cost them a fortune to do that because nothing was in the studio. It was all, all on location. So goodness knows how they did it, but um, it, it, they were very good. And I think on the whole, they showed brass bands in a very good light. Why? Well, they showed a group of people who were passionate about music. They showed a group, group of people who were articulate when they spoke. They showed a balance, a gender balance, which was very healthy between male and female in brass bands something that's, let's face it, has only been the case in the last 20 odd years or so. And that is so healthy. Some of the best brass players I know are female, not male. So all of those things were, I think, very positive and showed brass bands in a, in, in a, in a strong light. But it did also show the kind of uh, mentality that some players and conductors have about contesting. The be all and end all of my life is contesting. It's the lifeblood of banding. Uh, we, we have to win at all costs. Mm, that's not, in my mind, anything much to do with the music. Why is that, I wonder? Well, what about the poor conductors? Sorry, David, I see you there right in front of me. Rather like Premier League coaches, they're either in or out, depending on their success or failure on the contesting platform. So to help their sanity, they ask composers to write tailor-made works for their particular band, for their particular outstanding soloists who are asked to come to and fro, front stage, backstage, all over the stage, like pop stars in a glitzy world of virtuosity. Where will it all end, I ask? But come on, surely they don't stoop to manipulating the score or rescoring the music in an attempt to impress the adjudicators? Goodness me, no. Surely not. And what of the poor adjudicators, stuck in their curtained world of veiled oral and non-visual experience? Quite poetic, that. I'm quite proud of that phrase. I dare to mention the thorny matter of, of closed adjudication, because can someone tell me where else in the competitive musical world is there a jury stuck in a curtained box without any visual reference to the performance on stage, and where the management even checked the sandwiches for secret messages. <laughs> As to who might be playing when. Because if they really wanted to cheat, all they, had to, all they have to do is get their mobile phone out for five seconds and find out the whole list of when the bands are. So isn't it time that we changed our attitude to juries, to adjudicators? And why don't we embrace the 20th century, let alone the 21st century, and let the adjudicators smell the fresh air and smell the roses on their way. 
Um, the one thing about that I would say is it's a strange phenomenon that now in certain areas where there's a set test piece and an, an own choice, in quite a number of contests now, the jury sits in the open for the own choice piece, but is still set in the box for the set test piece. I don't get that. I really do not understand the psychology of that. It's a compromise, I suppose, between the traditional way of really not trusting adjudicators and trusting them. Halfway house, my theory is that we should go with the full, the full blown. So how has it come to this? Well, in my estimation, it's partly through the rise and success of European banding and the huge success of the European Brass Band Festival. And I'll just digress here for a moment by saying that one of the great refreshing things that I think that has happened in the last 40 years is the rise of European banding. Um, I remember well, because I was there and I was actually adjudicating, um, when the first non-British band won the European com competition, and that was Ikanga. I think it was 1988, and I happened to be there because Connotations was the test piece. And incidentally, that's interesting, isn't it? Now, they wouldn't dare set connotations now. as It's too easy. Well, that's another matter. Music is never easy. Just because people are flying around playing demi-semi quavers and going up to super Fs, it doesn't mean to say that that makes the music difficult. Because anybody can do that these days who is a super player. I've always thought that you could set the middle movement of the Moor Side Suite at the Albert Hall and it would sort out all the bands. Just think about that for a minute. That is such difficult music. And if you, if you speak to any professional musician, whether they be an instrumentalist, a pianist, a violinist, or whatever, and you ask them, you know, what's the most difficult music to play? And they'll probably say Mozart. And the old saying that Mozart is, Mozart is too easy for amateurs, for children, and it's too difficult for, for professionals. And again, just think about that. In other words, it's nothing to do with what might call the front end of music, about how difficult it looks on the page. Something can look deceptively simple on the page and yet be extremely difficult to play. So again, I hope that we get out of this spiral of ever increasingly virtuosic, for virtuosity's sake, test pieces. Because it's not the answer. It's not the answer for brass bands to move forward in the musical world. But to get back to, um, to, get back to uh, the European Brass Band Festival, it has, of course, created an appealing and highly successful brand in its own right. And we know that competitions now, competitive banding is pan-European. The best, or should I say the most successful conductors and players, are exported and imported, rather like the football market. And from what I hear on the grapevine, are often paid staggering sums of money to do so. Much more per hour, I might say, than the poor composers who write the music for them. Just go, ah, oh, ah, oh, thank you. Peter, note that, you know. And composers around Europe, not necessarily always the best ones, are commissioned to write the test pieces and own choice pieces, as I said, of ever-increasing virtuosity. So what has this actually got to do with music? Well, probably very little, and I'm, I'm not the only person to think that contesting has been called a sport. And if you think about that, there's probably more allusions to what happens in other uh, areas uh, that, that probably would make that statement half true anyway. Don't take my opinion on this only, though. Here's Trevor Herbert writing in the recently published and, by the way, excellent Cambridge Encyclopedia of Brass Instruments under the entry, The British Brass Band, under the subheading of Performance, Style and Idiom. By the way, it's an excellent book if you fancy paying £100, but it's very thick, very heavy. Uh, while the decisive influence on the British brass band sound has been the instrumentation, it would be wrong to ignore other factors such as performance traditions and the inertia in musical attitudes that the culture of contesting has encouraged. It can be argued that the contesting ethos has promoted insularity from other performance styles. He then balances that with the equally true statement, as I've said above, that contesting has raised standards to an unparalleled degree. And here's the dilemma. Without contesting, bands would never have reached the extraordinarily high standards which we now experience. So we've got a classic chicken and egg situation, a sort of catch-22. 
But you're going to be discussing that, some of you, in breakout sessions, so I'm going to be very interested to hear what other people think about this. Let me go on to composers and repertoire. Uh, the choice of composers asked to write test pieces for major competitions rests with the management of those com competitions. There's naturally an inbuilt fear of getting a dud, a work that neither the bands nor the audiences like. And so there's a natural tendency to play safe, to go with the tried and tested and composers they know will work. But like any other species, the repertoire will only be enhanced long term if the gene pool is diversified. The stronger the gene pool, the longer the species survives. And if you look at the history of human, human beings, that's certainly true. Um, if, when I say outside composers, I simply mean composers who have never or hardly ever written for bands before are asked to write with all the risks that might go with that and do go with that. It requires brave and visionary thinking, just as John Henry Ars and his associates all those years ago gave us that golden era of repertoire by some of the greatest uh, English composers. And I remember within my own lifetime, those pieces that were heavily criticized by the more conservative members of the brass band community. And if I only mention Gilbert Vinter's Spectrum, Robert Simpson's Energy, Elgar Howarth's Fireworks, Thomas Wilson's Refrains and Cadenzas, Bramall Tovey's A Night to Sing, Judith Bingham's Prague, and John Pickard's Eden. I hope that makes my point. They're all very fine works in their own right, but seemingly for some in the brass band world, it was, it was the end of the world. It's actually the composers who write for many other genres that will bring a renewed energy and originality to writing for brass band. So we seem to have sunk to some extent into a lingua franca of musical style and language that's often rather predictable. At its worst, a cross between Hollywood techno film music with jazz and rock inflections, or on the other hand, maybe it's just me being boringly old fashioned. But I'd like to know what your views are on that, and I hope that Peter, for example, will come to the session on, on that as a composer, because composers, I have to say, are under great pressure as far as this is concerned. And it's not very comfortable always to feel that you're being manipulated to write more difficult and difficult music, when actually all you should be writing is a piece of music. The idea that you write a, a piece of music that ticks boxes, which I hate that phrase, um, is really not going to be something for the future of the repertoire. It has to be a mu piece of music in its own right that will survive, and survive onto the contest, uh, onto the concert platform. Adjudicators. Once again, we must increase the gene pool. There's still an inbuilt suspicion, as many of you will know from some people, that anyone who is not immersed in the world of banding doesn't really understand and therefore cannot be trusted. There are many fine professional brass players, composers and conductors out there, many who started life actually playing in a brass band, who would be ideal to enhance this pool of adjudicators at brass band contests. And to be fair, some of the major contests have embraced this and continue to embrace this view. I just want to see it enlarged. Indeed, I, from a personal point of view, I remember very well that when Connotations was used as a test piece at the national competition, the Albert Hall, in 1977, David Wilcox was one of the adjudicators. Now, what did he know about brass bands? Very little. But he was a wonderful musician. And that's the word we must use more and more Musician, a musician who happens to play the tenor horn, a musician who happens to conduct. We need to, to change our psychology about, about the way that we view adjudicators. I don't play the saxophone or a string instrument, and yet I'd feel perfectly happy to be asked to judge a saxophone ensemble or string quartet competition, and indeed I have. So once again, let's be bold in the process of thinking, but in the process, uh, the box may have to disappear forever. Structure of contesting. Uh, to be controversial once again, I, I do actually believe that the days of contesting with 20 bands playing one set piece of music is drawing to a close. The most popular form of competitive banding these days is undoubtedly the own choice model. Or in more recent cases that we've seen, for example, the Band of the Year at the Stoller Hall and other ones, uh, 25-minute own choice programs where bands have to think carefully about the repertoire and play it 
to a highly professional standard. You might think that's a bit rich coming from me, who's just been commissioned to write a test piece for five European countries. I now get that. But I'm a composer and I respond to commissions. Um, and I have, I hope, written a piece of music and not a test piece, if you, if you get my drift. The concert platform. One of the things that most disappoints me um, about concert, concert giving by brass bands at the moment, and indeed may have been true for many years, and I think Kenny alluded to this, it seemed to me that there's a desperate lack of creative artistic planning in most brass band programs. The age-old formula of a mixture of light music, plus some film music, stand-up soloists, and one good test piece thrown in for good taste, for me just doesn't work, and certainly does not attract a younger audience. The one serious festival of original brass band music, which I alluded to earlier, is of course the, the Festival of Brass at the RNCM, which is Paul Hindmarsh's baby. And without him and his work over the last 20 years, goodness knows what would have happened to brass band repertoire. We have a lot to thank him for. This festival attracts, I'm sure some of you go to this, and some of you conducted it, I know, and some of you have music played in it, so you know all about it. But it attracts a loyal audience um, with a good mixture of age groups, and takes the band out of their comfort zone, and certainly airs the best of original music from old to contemporary. And I must say, I also applaud the bands and their conductors who participate in that festival, because without that, ded that dedication to, to play that repertoire and, and to rehearse it, it just wouldn't happen. So I hope that the leading bands of this country, together with Brass Bands England, can re-engage the enthusiasm of classical festivals to invite them back into their program planning but surely not to play traditional programs. Also to think about cultural diversity, to work with other genres of music, and to bring brass bands into the wider musical world. Um, I was going to uh, talk about copyright at this stage, but I'm not going to do it because I think I've only just got about five minutes left. So um, I will, will wait to the later session on copyright, and if, if I can put my oar in there for a couple of minutes, I will. It's just to say that, as we know, in the new digital age, copyright has become an increasing problem. It's a massive problem for copyright owners, such as composers and publishers, but it's also a problem for bands themselves in terms of intellectual property, the performance. What happens, for example, during a stream? I mean, we've had recent examples of that, um, and a streaming becomes absolutely a certain thing for the future. And by the way, I think that's terrific. It's great that, you know, you can be sitting in, a, in, a, in, in your sitting room in Toronto in Canada and you can actually come in and pay your subscription and watch a competition taking place. Fantastic. So I've, I'm not against streaming at all. But one has to consider the rights, the copyright, which is held for the performance and for the music. And that's it become an increasing problem for copyright owners, for example, in, in, in the digital world of streaming platforms and downloading. Interesting that downloading has taken a back seat now and streaming has become the main, the main uh, world uh, that people engage with. And it's very difficult, I know this from my own experience as a director at the PRS, it's very difficult to get the right deals with those multinational companies to ensure that copyright owners actually receive the dues that they should. And it's all, it's, it's all very well if you happen to be a leading pop star, because you'll probably get a million hits a day on your song. But if you're Edward Gregson or Peter Graham, you probably get 10 or something, for which we receive 0 0.000001 of a penny, or something like that, Peter, isn't it? It's not very much. Uh, but copyright's going to be discussed, so I won't, I won't um, talk about that now. Education in the community. Um, bands have always played an important role in social and religious life of this country, that's obvious, and their importance cannot be underestimated. Indeed, in the area where I live, near Macclesfield, there are a number of village and town bands together with their youth offshoots, and they're really important in so many ways. And indeed, we had a great example this morning of the Wardle High School band, who are one of the leading uh, youth bands in this country, and that has come out of uh, a willingness and a desire at school level to teach brass instruments to school kids and let them form the brass band and the infrastructure that supports that. And I think that all brass bands, particularly the top bands, have a duty 
to actually engage with youth bands of their own, to create them, to foster them, to teach them. Because let's face it, music education in this country, in the schools in this country, is a disgrace. Government after government seems to think that music is not important. And yet all the leading reports um, from educators around the world suggests that the creative work in schools, whether it be music or art or poetry or whatever it is, increases literacy by huge levels. Why don't governments get this? Answer on a postcard. Um, I could talk a lot more about education in the community, but again, that will have to wait for later sessions. So finally, I'd just like to talk about what I consider to be one of the most important um, engines for change, if I can put it that way. And indeed, that's why we're here today. And it's the, the, the question of Brass Bands England and where they're going and where we're going as part of the Brass Band community. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't believe that the new organization has a vital role to play in the future of banding in this country. Long gone are the days when banding can exist with an amateur frame of mind in its administrative organization. It's time for a comprehensive rethink, a root and branch re rethink of how banding is run in this country. And I mean by all the way from the roots of community banding and education to the national competitions. With all the ramifications that that has, for example, one-stop registration of players, artistic credibility that links to the cultural life of this country. Much talk in the future post-Brexit world, and that's the only time I mentioned Brexit this morning, Most, a lot of talk has been centered on whether the Norwegian model will work for this country. Well, I'm not going to comment on that side of it, but what I do know in terms of the future of banding is that the Norwegian model is definitely the, the exemplar. So I, as part of this, I decided to write to Berit Hangeland about how their system works. Uh, and here are very quickly my res the responses, some of them. Um, within five years, um, I see the, sorry, uh, here we go. Um, we don't have, I asked about how it's structured, how it's funded. I said, uh, does each band pay for annual membership for NMF or is it individuals and who pays? She says, we don't have individual as members, only bands. Each band has an annual fee and then they pay per head in membership fee, uh, per head, and also a compulsory insurance fee. That amounts in sterling to around just over a thousand pounds per band per year. Um, I presume you can't enter any brass band or wind band competition in Norway without being members. No, every member is registered and not allowed to participate with having paid the annual fee and contest fee. This is contests organized by the Federation. Private contests don't have the same rules. How much does NMF do to promote and support wider initiatives, commissioning of new works, etc.? We support commissions for contests in between and support bands if they have interesting projects. We recently supported music for people not playing in a band, a pedagog ped pedagogical project called Play Together. Present time, we support new compositions for lower section bands. They also have other schemes. So you can see it goes way beyond just supporting competitions. How much interaction is there between NMF and the Norwegian government? This will blow your mind when you hear about the levels of funding. Our government supports us from various departments. From the Cent cultural department, we receive 240,000 a year. From the children and families department, 320,000 a year. From the education department, 250,000 a year. And in addition, we receive, and I hope she's got this right, and unless the decimal point's in the wrong place, uh, 8.1 million pounds a year, which comes from lottery money, grant to education, grants to buy instruments, and VAT reimbursements. This is money the bands apply for, but can be funded. In other words, if you want a new set of instruments, it comes out of lottery funding. As similarly, the Arts Council of England, who I'm very pleased to see are here today, supporting brass bands, supporting this organization, the Arts Council England have a great role to play in the future of banding, but I'm sure they, like everybody, want to make sure that actually the professional status is there. I could say a lot more about Norway, but I don't have the time. But we can't, we can't possibly dream of having such massive funding for that model. But what it does show, um, ladies and gentlemen, is this, that a national organization should be at the root of organization and supporting 
and producing artistic and creative integrity for brass bands in this country. And I haven't had any pound, 50 pound notes in brown paper envelopes given me for this. I passionately believe it is the only way forward. And if I could have a, a finally a crystal ball gaze Within five years, I see one organisation running banding in England with a seminal relationship to its sister organisations in Scotland and Wales. Every band, and thus every player, would have to be a member of, paid up member of BBE, otherwise they wouldn't be eligible to enter the national competitions, which incidentally would then be owned by BBE. Pause, dramatic pause. I don't know whether that will happen, but I tell you this, it should happen, because around Europe, it's the national federations of banding that actually run the national competition. That has to happen in this country, and I, I make no, no non-supportive thing for the people who have run it up until this stage, including the current capital promotions, because they've done it with, with great integrity and support and dedication. But it's time that that has to change. Um, BBE would, of course, initiate lots of other things. Masterclasses, workshops, strategic artistic policy, close relationship with Arts Council England to support schemes such as composers in residence for young composers. They would try to address diversity, gender balance, racial issues of diversity. All of those things have to be considered. Um, and I hope they would also be in time be able to establish a library and archive of brass band music and recordings, which would be a, a great sort of place for conductors and players to go, uh, to go and look at all the, all the music and all the scores. Of course, the part of the deal there is that Brass Bands England have to prove that they're a professional organisation. They have to be accountable, actually, to the bands. The bands would become the shareholders, as it were, of Brass Bands England, and they would be responsible. But it needs brass bands themselves to change the way that they think about their own futures and the future of banding in this country. And I'm afraid at the moment um, we have to rid ourselves of some of the self-interest and, and tribalism that exists in banding, which is not very healthily, healthy. So if my, if my comments have been controversial, yes they have, that's only been in the best interest of banding in this country because I passionately believe in banding. That's why, albeit every seven years I write a piece for brass bands, I continue to come back to the brass band world. I love the brass band world. I love the people in it. I love the enthusiasm and the passion of the players. I went down to my local band the other evening, Bollington Town Band. They were preparing for the second section finals. The test piece was occasion, uh, which is a piece of mine from the 80s. And I went down to help them and talk to them. Um, didn't help, actually, because they didn't win. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, but they were a great bunch of people. And, and it just reflects the diversity of what brass bands are about in this country. I asked them what they all did. I find that interesting. One was a radiologist at, at uh, Manchester Royal Infirmary. One was an IT manager. There was a bus driver. There were supermarket workers. There were youngsters still at school. And there were students going to university and colleges of music. And what brings them all together, as I said, this passion for music making. And so I come back to the passion and I remember those two lines of the Arthur O'Shaughnessy poem which he wrote called Ode in 1873. And it was set memorably by Elgar. But these are the first two lines. We are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams. It's not politicians that change the world. It's, it's architects. It's musicians, it's composers, it's artists, it's engineers. All of those people who have the creative imagination to change the world that we live in and will change the world we live in, those are the people that are the real movers and shakers. So I wish you the best for today, and I hope that uh, Brass Band England's mantra of better banding for all is something that we all share. Thank you very much. I did promise you it would be engaging and uh, wonderful um, 45 minutes or so in the company, uh, one of our most illustrious uh, people, not just composers, 
ever to enter the world of brass bands.